Thank you. Our next presenter is Michael Bertinger from the German Climate Future Center. Yes. So, uh, actually, first, uh, thanks for inviting me here. Um, I would like to talk about a slightly different aspect of data, so um, about data services more about what we can do with data, um, especially what to gain inside from the data. Might be a good idea to visualize the data because we can easier um, understand images compared to raw numbers. Um, DKRZ is kind of a German national facility. Uh, we are a high performance computing center, so we have a quite large supercomputer uh, connected to a high capacity storage system and, uh, of course, a very large data. And we run also some data services um, you are usually talking here. It's around uh, about like the uh, World Data Center climate, and uh, we are also part of ESGF, so we are uh, part of it as well as we know. And um, around all this technical stuff, we uh, run also lots of services um, which help climate modelers to make use of our we are organized as a limited company, but it's a non-profit company, so we have shareholders which are all public. And um, coming back to the data, um, so we have this very large machine, so it's quite new, it's called HLRP3, and the German word uh, which is abbreviated here is Höchstleistungsrechner-System für die Erdsystemforschung. Very easy to understand. So high-performance computer system for uh, climate research. Uh, one word. One word. Yeah, okay. And so this is HLIP3. And the first phase has 1.4 petaflops uh, performance. And uh, next year we will have an extension and then we will have uh, 3 petaflops. So this will bring uh, us back into the top 500. We have been there several times, but when the computer gets old, you are getting out of this uh, on a list. But um, I, I will focus more on the data. So we have quite a large file system. So it's a parallel file system, which is more or less used like a very large disk, which is currently 20 petabytes or 20,000 terabytes. And next year it will be 50 petabytes. There's a reason for it because we have um, quite large model outputs uh, which we have to store. So, what we usually do is running time simulations on the machine and continuously the data has to be stored and archived, of course, in the uh, data archive. And um, so, the total capacity of the archive is up to 500. So it's really huge. Um, we have a five petabytes disk cache, which is also just for a cache, reasonable. Um, so we produce lots of data continuously and have to store it, and of course we also have to look at it. And when we want to look at data of that size, it's not a good idea to transfer the raw data to the user, of course it would take too long and the user might also not have terabytes of this space so, so therefore we have a visualization server which is attached to the facility and uh, through a remote 3D visualization application every user at DKZ can interactively work with this um, climate model data with this large data and view the interactive visualization directly at this Desk. This is done with a remote 3D rendering system. So it's basically a server which um, renders the images and the images are transferred like a video stream to the laptop or another office uh, computer. And keyboard and mouse signal are stored back to the machine, and so therefore you can interactively work with it. So this is a visualization server we have new. Our older system was a little bit more 
heterogeneous. So we have 12 nodes. This means 12 different people can run interactive sessions at the same time. Next year it will be extended by another 12 nodes. So, what's usually done in the society, in our um, community? Usually people uh, use 1D or 2D graphics, they use scripts or simple batch ops, and this is actually yeah, sufficient for, for many problems, but um, it's not necessarily sufficient when you want to, to visualize um, complicated interdependencies between different aspects of the data. So therefore, we have some additional services at DKZ. We provide interactive 3D visualization. For example, here we see 3D cuts through the ocean, a regional ocean model showing a oxygen minimum here. Uh, we have so software, hardware, and remote visualization facilities. Locally, I think uh, that people can use our power board, for example. Or um, we also have a climate group, which I, I'm sorry not to be able to present here. So it was actually intended to do that, but um, it was not possible to bring it to Paris. Um, we write tutorials how to use the stuff. We, uh, we are doing application projects. So we help the scientists to, to visualize their data. And furthermore, we uh, also have uh, some uh, yeah, small amount of, of manpower dedicated for in-house development for additions to the public domain software, for example, which makes uh, the life of our researchers and our users easier. <laughs> How does climate model data look like? So usually it's cross georeference data, and um, yeah, people uh, have to deal with different grids. So in normal times, we have mostly have had uh, regular or rectilinear grids, but today uh, we have to deal with irregular grids mostly. And this is um, maybe good for modeling, but it's not good for visualization. Actually, to, to find visualization solutions which um, support direct rendering of the regular grid. So the data we have to deal with is time dependent, and we have very long time series. So currently, the project has been started to simulate 135,000 years of the, the ice age cycles. So it's a really long time period, and. Um, of course, we have ensemble experiments, and uh, we have to deal with the uh, different formats. Um, but usually, we restrict ourselves to two formats, and these are also the formats which are usually used in the community, used in the community for the work of the data. And there's a whole zoo of visualization tools available. Some of them public domain, and some of them uh, like IDL or MATLAB or Mathematica cost the money. And even in the 3D world, there are also some solutions like Aviso, which I like very much, which costs a lot of money. So that's the bad side. But um, since our users can use the software installed in our system, everybody who uses Sticker Z can run Aviso. And here the software solutions marked in red are the solutions where we put some effort in to uh, help to develop NCL, we help to develop Honorview and Vapor. So some solutions which are from like NCL and Vapor from uh, NCAR. But coming back to Aviso, which I like very much. It's just this is a nice software which uh, easily lets you import some data and render it. So this is a, a spherical rendering of the water um, vapor or the 
relative humidity uh, of a simulation model here. So it's a volume rendering, volumetric uh, rendering, so it's not only a and, and turn it around if, if it's in gray. Um, so a video comes to the net CDFC app reader, so it uh, helps us to, to deal with the data. It uh, contains various map projections, and uh, which is also quite important for visualization is, uh, to visualize data together with the cont uh, context. So if you visualize a nice ocean field, ocean data field without the context, it doesn't make sense because it's not registered. Registered. So uh, we have a graph module which can be also excluded to 3D orography uh, or bathymetry and uh, has a continental molecule outline and these kind of things. Our view is public domain, so this is quite good. Um, but it's to me it's not as easy to use, but it's quite powerful because here you can do different things. You can, for example, use a uh, technique called um, linked views. So, so you, you see different views of the data at the same time. And you can uh, use a brush to mark part of the data. And then you see in the other windows at the same time which part of the data you have brushed. For example, here are some uh, marked dots. I don't, don't know if you can see them uh, around Antarctica. And uh, this is marked here like um, low temperatures and high salinity or something like that. So you can see the uh, registration of the data you have marked in another window. This is easy. Uh, this is a nice tool to interactively find out the uh, relation between different um, parts of the same data set. Another tool which I think is quite promising is Vapor because Vapor comes with a nice technique that stores the data in its own internal data format, which is a wavelet based. This uh, makes it easy to use kind of level of detail te technique. So for very large data sets, you can uh, for very large data sets you can interactively browse into it. And then the level of detail is loaded uh, while you are browsing in. <coughs> so now I come back to some visual examples. And uh, because of the event, I've chosen some which are related to climate change. So this is a typical 2D visualization, of course, uh, but also done with a visual. It shows you the two different developments which are uh, marking the corridor of possible futures we have. So this is RCP 8.5, 2.6, and you see the spatial temporal development of temperature change in comparison. You see, of course, that the continents are warming much faster compared to the ocean area. And that here in the Arctic, or RCP 8.5, specifically, we have very uh, strong warming, like 10 degrees, which is ridiculous. Of course, when the temperature is changing, the uh, other things in the climate system are changing as well, like the precipitation, another 2D visualization, shows you the uh, precipitation change by the end of the century compared to today in percent. Red means it gets drier, blue means it gets wetter. But uh, since it's a percentual change, um, you have to know the typical normal range to in interpret it, right? So therefore, I have developed this uh, visualization here, which shows you the normal undisturbed range of today, uh, like the model would see it. The height of these map, uh, the, these uh, bars, and the change in the future compared to today is shown by the color. So this thing here, which comes up from time to time, is the uh, monsoon area. So this is normal. This is not uh, very meaningful here. 
But what is meaningful is when we have very small bars and at the same time a red color, because this means it would hurt. People who live there won't have the water for agriculture or for the living anymore. Another aspect of the climate system, so today we have Earth system models. Here I've cut out two slices of the world ocean, and I show you the uh, uh, carbonate contents, the saturation of the world ocean. And this time red is good, because there we have carbonate. And uh, blue means it's not so good, because when the water is undersaturated, no shells can grow or uh, uh, other uh, little species in the ocean. They need the carbonate to grow. Um, corals, and, uh, little crabs, things like that. And uh, when I run this again, you see that in the beginning, all the surface water is over, super saturated, and only here in the deep Pacific we have uh, undersaturated water. But when we go on with uh, RCP 8.5, we will have a complete changed world. Completely changed world because then we have large areas of the planet which has uh, only unassimilated water. So the whole food chain would change. Also not so good. Of course, we don't only visualize uh, things which show climate change. We are first to understand the climate. So we do things like this here. Here you can see two different aspects of the ocean circulation at the same time. One is the temperature, the second is the flow. So the velocity is shown as a little bump shading of the surface, while the temperature is shown by the color. You can easily see the live stream here, um, the evolution of eddies. And the interesting thing is uh, now um, satellite could show this because this is a slice in 75 meters depth. This is a typical 3D animation and uh, shows you uh, again the relative humidity in the air, so like the clouds. And at the same time, the red and blue things here, uh, the vorticity of, um, in the air. And um, the vorticity is uh, the quantity of the dynamics of the atmospheric flow. It shows you. Uh, the rotational part of the movement. And yeah, the problems we see is that we, we get to larger and larger model resolutions, and larger and larger model resolutions yeah, uh, mean that we have more and more grid points. More grid points than we have um, pixels on the screen. So here we have 1,000 by 1,000 kilometer with 100 meter resolution line means 10,000 by 10,000 by 250 grid points. And this has some implications because we have to store a lot of data, maybe more than we can do. Okay, so to, to wrap up, um, we have some sufficient tools for visualizing some model data, but when we look for the future, with very high resolution, which is coming up, uh, we are not really sure how to deal with it. So we may need other paradigms for visualize, visualizing the data, like um, in situ visualization, which doesn't mean in situ somewhere on the planet, it means in the high performance computer. While the code, the simulation is running, we have to extract the um, visual information. And finally, the takeaway message, of course, a very important one visualization can have. So, and this is uh, the climate that we have missed. Thank you.